this entire series is going to be four parts, starting with today. Number one, we, we want to call it, today's message is called Our Dream. What is our dream for you? What is God's dream for you, in other words? What, what is our prayer? Whenever we sit down as a team, as a pastoral team, and we begin to pray for you, what do we actually pray for you? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, because I think that's what God wants to do in your life. Number two, next week, we're going to talk about how you are designed, your design. We're going to talk about why were you created the way you were created in this world? Why did God bring you into this world? That's what we're going to talk about next week. And week three, we're going to talk about what is God's desire? Um, what does God want to see happening inside you? That's what we're going to talk about in week three. And week four, we're going to talk about your decision. How do you, now in, the, in the context of what you've heard about your life and what God wants to do with you, uh, what should be your move? That's what we're going to talk about. Um, it's your decision. At the end of the day, God always leaves the choice to us. And so we're going to close the series talking about what, what would be a right decision for you to make. That's what we're going to talk about. Is that okay? Does it make sense? All right, let's start, about, let's start today. Uh, we're talking about our dream for you. Um, uh, there's nobody better than Paul who puts that, you know, who puts words to our dream. Ephesians chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 1, if you, if you have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 1, verses um, uh, 16 to 20. I'm reading from New Living Translation. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16. I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts would be flooded with the light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at, God, at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. The same passage, I'll read it in a different version called message version. Just few verses, verses 17 to 19. Uh, I, I liked that version, the, the way it was uh, translated into English. So let's just go, uh, let me read it. If you don't have a message, don't worry. Uh, just listen to me. I ask the God, our master, Jesus Christ. Um, God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so that you can, ex you can see exactly what it is God is calling, to, calling you to do and grasp the immensity of the glorious way, this glorious way of life he has for his followers. So if I have to... Um, uh, help you to understand what our prayer is for you. In fact, I think this is what God wants to do in Capstone. Is this, um, it's a fourfold prayer. Number one, we pray that you may know God. That's number one. We pray that you may know God. Number two, we pray that you would find freedom. We pray that you would find freedom. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, you will find freedom. Number three, that you may discover your purpose. That we believe God created you with a purpose. And we believe unless you find the purpose of God for your life, you will always feel empty and incomplete. So our job, that job that God, responsibility that God placed upon our lives is that that we help you to discover your purpose. Number four, that we believe, we pray that you would begin to make a difference with your life. We believe that God not only has a purpose for your life, but that purpose is that you may begin to make a difference with your life. We'll talk about that today. Let me just take uh, uh, this, today's uh, topic and talk about these four fold aspects of our prayer. Number one, our prayer is that you may know God. Isn't that what Paul is saying? I pray that you may know him better, he says. I pray that you may know him better. It's my prayer as a pastor it's our prayer as a team uh, that serves in this church. It's in fact 
the heart of God that you would know him. Right from the beginning in the book of Genesis, from the book of Genesis, all the way to the end, to the book of Revelation, you would see that our God is a communicating God. That he always wanted to talk to people. Even if people are not taking the step towards him, he was the one who took the first step to talk to people. Even if people chose not to listen to him and run away from him, he, as a God, never stopped pursuing people and communicating with people constantly. You would always see God as a God who is interested in a relationship with you. We believe the primary reason for the existence of a church should be to help people to know God. You see, it doesn't matter if you remember my name. By the way, those of you who joined us for the last six weeks, my name is Chaitanya. I pastor this church. I know you didn't get to see me last six weeks, but I'm glad I'm here today. It doesn't matter if you know my name or not. What matters is that you know God. It doesn't matter if you like this church or not. What matters is that you know God. God is interested in revealing himself to you. Our prayer is that at the end of two hours sitting in this place, that you would walk away with an encounter with God, knowing some part of who your God is. With some understanding of who your God is. In fact, the reason we think it is very serious is because of this. Because of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. Jesus says, Jesus is talking to his people and this is what he's saying. Listen to this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says he's a Christian will enter into the heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian all your life, you won't go to heaven. Unless you know him personally. Let me, let me read that. In fact, that will that'll put my thought into perspective for you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Uh, in your name, drive out the demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. One of the biggest temptations for us, for me specifically, when we were uh, pioneering this church, Carstone, in our first few years, we were growing really slowly. Maybe 40 people, 50 people. Our fourth year was, was, was when we thought we hit the peak. We were 80 people every Sunday. And, you know, I, I always had this struggle in my head. God, you, you got to help me to increase this church. I just didn't know how to do that. So I began to look at all the other churches that are growing and, and thought maybe if I do what they are doing, we'll probably grow. Uh, maybe if I also ask God to give me a gift of healing, if, if I ask God to give me a gift of prophecy, maybe then I'll attract more people. It was, uh, it was during that struggle where I could have actually leaned on to that. God spoke to me through this passage. I said, it doesn't matter if you do miracles. It doesn't matter if you cast out demons, miracles are good. Casting out demons is also good, by the way. It doesn't matter if you prophesy. If you don't know me, if people who come to the church don't know God, what's the point of the church? Does it make sense right now? So our goal, we decided on that day, is going to be this. That we help people who come here... Who, people who know God, people who don't know God, people who are seeking God, people who have a question, who have a question about God. As you walk into this place, you walk back with some kind of understanding of who God is. That's our goal. That's our prayer. That each Sunday, our goal is to meet that. That's all. Our goal for you is this, that you will, know, you will have a personal knowledge of who God is. That you will have a personal communion with God. And that you will have a personal revelation from God. That's our prayer for you. That you will have a personal knowledge of God. As we stand here and open the scriptures for you and begin to talk to you about God. You will have some kind of, you will gain some kind of knowledge of who God is. And then you will begin to show interest in relationship with him. That's what we call communion. That you would say, hey, if this is the kind of God he is, I want to be in relationship with him. I want to know who he is. 
I want to grow in him. That you would begin to pursue a, a, a relationship with him and then you will have an encounter with him. That at some point you, in your journey at this place, that God would speak to you personally. Individually, you know. We all have those defining moments. We call it encounters. Those moments where you, you kind of saw God in a completely new light. And your understanding of God completely changed. And that moment decided how you're going to live for the rest of your life. I had that moment uh, in my college days. I was a rebel at my home. I, I was adopted into a wonderful Christian home. But never uh, really felt that I would fit into that home. Would constantly choose to run away from the home. Even though my dad is one of the greatest men I've ever seen who lived on the earth. He loved God. He served God. But I just didn't fit into that home. God knows how many times I ran away. But one particular day when I ran away and came back home, my father, by the way, every time would always take me back in, would always forgive me even though I'm, I was an adopted son. He would always back, take, back, take me back without, um, uh, you know, without showing any, any sign of hatred towards me. I would always choose to forgive me and offer forgiveness and take me back into home. This one particular day, I remember, this is when I felt this is, this is what God is. You know? When he took me, when I came back home, he took me to my room and, uh, you know, as I walked inside, as he walked him uh, along with me into, inside and closed the door, he looked at me and he held my hands together. I was, a, I was a thin guy. If he really wanted to beat me up, he could beat me up to pulp on that day. And I, I thought he was actually going to beat me up. He held my hands together, this thin, feeble hands, this strong, burly man. And he's looking into my eyes, his eyes filled with tears. He's saying, mm, I don't know what else I can do to you to, to, to show you that I love you. That's the day I thought I saw God. That's the day I thought, oh, this must be Jesus. If this is Jesus, I would follow him anywhere. If this is the God that, I, that my father believes in him and follows him, that's the God I want. It changed the way I looked at God from that day. It changed my commitment to God, that moment. We want to see those kind of encounters happening in this church. That you somehow has this one moment, one word that strikes your heart so much that you feel, if that's the God, I want to follow him. You see, that's the desire of God. God wants to reveal himself to you. So our prayer is this, that you may know him personally. Not as a Christian, but a person, as a person. As a person, not as a boy or a girl who is born in a Christian home, but as a person, as an individual who has a relationship with Jesus. This week, my daughter asked me a question that I think she was one of the best questions somebody, any young person asked me. She came to me and said, what do you call Christianity? Do you call it religion or a relationship? Man, I thought, I, I wish I was that smart when I was young. Well, what should I tell in the, in the school if they ask me, what is Christianity? Should we say religion or relationship? What God wants to do is to have that with you, a relationship. So that's why we want to design our services with four simple values. That each Sunday, we have the opportunity to celebrate. Sundays are the opportunities when we come together uh, to celebrate what God has done in our lives. We believe that church should be enjoyable. We believe that you should be, you should be, you should be actually excited to come to church. Not to, you know, we don't want to see you coming to church saying, okay, my father told me to go to church. My mother told me to go to church. I have to go to church. I don't want you to come to church like that. What's the point of coming to church like that? We want you to come to church because you enjoy your time here. That this joy that you have, these two hours, is, is something that you would carry throughout the week. That keeps you going throughout the week. Sundays are supposed to be a times of celebration. Sundays are supposed to be times of inspiration. We want to see what happens in this church should inspire you 
that song that they sing or somebody who stands up and gives a testimony or, or, or the word of God that comes from the pulpit, it doesn't matter who shares the word of God, that the word of God is coming is more important. That as it is coming, it inspires your heart. It would say, hey, you know, I'm losing faith, but what is happening in their life is causing me to believe in God more. That's why we, we believe in staying back and having conversations with people. We'll talk about relationships in the next point. But, uh, you know, we want to see that you have a time of conversation with other believers who are sitting with you so that you get inspired by them. Sundays, uh, we, want, we want to see celebration happening. We want to see inspiration taking place. Um, we want to see that you are prepared for the next week. We believe Sunday services are times of preparation. That our, we believe that church should be a place where people learn how Bible applies to their personal lives. We believe that. We don't want to use this pulpit to talk to you about what would happen in, a, in end times. I mean, I, although I would love to talk about that, but I don't think that's the time here. The time here that we use, uh, you know, we, um, on this pulpit should be used to teach you how can you apply what is told in the Bible to your life? Because I know you would walk into this place with all kinds of struggles. You've got many battles going on in your life. Physical battles, spiritual battles, emotional battles. Maybe battles in relationships. Maybe you have a battle at your professional uh, uh, location. Maybe you have a battle with, uh, in your business. I don't know. I'm sure many of you walked into this place with all kinds of struggles. What we know, I know, is this, that you need to go back from here saying that I can face this. I can face this. I've learned something on how to face that on this Sunday. That's our goal. That's our prayer. That we don't want you to go back from here listening to another 45 minutes of blabbering. We want you to go back from here thinking, God spoke to me today. And I can use this in my personal life. That's our prayer for you. Prepare you to face your world. Number four, of course, this is the fourth value and it's a very important value that we want to see every Sunday people get saved. That there is a salvation experience for people who do not know God. It could be possible that some of you walked into this place with a question mark about Jesus, with your relationship about Jesus, and you have always been struggling. Or maybe you walked into this place with absolutely no idea of who Jesus is. We want to help you to know who Jesus is. Find him as your personal savior. After all, what's a church where people are not getting saved? If people are not getting saved in a church, it should become a country club. We believe church is a place where people find God and know Him. That's the heart of God for you. That you may know Him. So number one, know God. That's our prayer. Number two, our prayer is this, that you would find freedom. I pray, this is what Paul is saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, focused and clear. What he means is this, that you would begin to see life in a completely different pers from a completely different perspective. See, many of us look at our lives, look at what is happening to us with a completely wrong perspective. That's why we choose to live in bondages, bondages of, um, of uh, fear of fail fear of rejection. One of the Reasons why God wants us to meet together as a, as a group of people is so that we can have fellowship with one another. That simply means this, that you will develop relationships. Some of you have been coming to Capstone, God knows for how long, and yet have no friend in church. Not because you don't want to have a friend, but because you think, what if they don't accept me as I am? What if, what my background, um, if it comes out, what would they think of me? Would they reject me? 
I mean, I may look sharp outside, but when I open my mouth, I can't even speak properly. That fear of being rejected because of inadequacies that you had or because of what you perceive as inadequacy in yourself. Fear of being rejected. And that's why many of us don't take the step towards developing healthy relationships within a local church. It could be possible that you did have bad relationships, unhealthy relationships that affected your trust in believing new people. It could even be possible that you really had a bad church experience before. So you are like, okay, I'm going to church because I don't want to stop going to church. I don't want to have anything to do with church. Especially to the guy who has the beard, weird looking beard. I, have, I want you to know this. You don't have to be friends with me. You can be friends with 100 other people inside the church, by the way. Bible calls all of us royal priesthood, not just me. You need to know that. Church is a place where you can find healthy relationships. Yes, they are not perfect relationships, but they are healthy relationships. This morning I was talking to our team and I told them, Hey, we need to remember this. We're all scrappy people. When Jesus um, took Peter out into the Galilean Sea the first time and asked him to cast the net on the other side when Peter was trying to tell him, hey, we, we tried all night. Uh, but Peter, you know, Jesus told him to do that and Peter then catches the fish. The moment he caught so much of fish, Peter realized he was standing in the presence of God. And the first thing that that came out of Peter's mouth is this. I'm a sinner. In the shadow of the holiness of God, he realized, I'm not even worthy to stand here. So in fact, he was begging Jesus, can you leave me? What happened after that always amuses me because Jesus looks at him then after Peter saying, I'm imperfect, I'm incomplete, I'm not the right guy. Jesus is saying, I'm going to change you and make you a world changer. Come and follow me. Jesus is always looking for scrappy people. Always looking for tax collectors and fishermen. Not perfect people. None of us are perfect here. Not even anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm the worst of you anyway. All of us are imperfect people. Jesus loves imperfect people. And if you if you don't make relationship with people like that around you, where are you going to find healthy relationships? So we want church to become a place where you find acceptance. This is the place you're accepted as you are. Not judged by the way you dress. Not judged by the way you, 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 know, you, you, you believe in certain things. Why well, you understand that. I don't think church should be a place that would condemn you a church should be a place that would teach you, correct you, help you to be corrected and show you which would be the right path. Whether you accept it or not, still accept you. I think there is, you know, I was listening to one of the speakers in PBTC, the People Who Come to Church Conference, um, and he said something that kind of stuck in my head. Uh, and th this is what he said. Church should not build fences. Instead, church should build wells. What we are doing, have been doing for long, is we've always been building fences. We belong to this particular denomination. We hold on to this particular doctrine. We, we, we belong to this particular ethnic group of people. We built so much of fences around us that people are scared to come to church. What we should have done was to dig wells. Because any thirsty person would always run to well. If somebody is looking for God and you show him a well, they would drink it. This should be the place where you are accepted as you are. And it is a place, I want to tell you that, it is a place where you are accepted as you are. Irrespective of what you have done before, where you are today. In your walk with God. Whether you believe in God or not, you're still accepted here. I want you to know that. Uh, we live in a bondage of a sense of abandonment. 
we feel that you know i've had a bad experience before uh or i've everything was good till i was doing well everybody was my friend and then the moment i did some, one mistake one single mistake everybody left me we've all been there didn't we in our lives we've always we all all of us whether we agreed or not we all have a secret we did something that we don't want anybody to know we would never talk about it we would hope even god would not talk about it in heaven but we know that we don't want to tell about that to anybody anybody absolutely zero we know that we all have sins that are under the rug right now but that one thing usually um fills us with so much of shame and guilt that it separates us from building relationships with others or maybe it did really separate you from other people a sense of abandonment seeped in, into you that you don't want to have anything to do with church anymore i've i've got to witness one of the one of the greatest moments that i could ever see in a church uh two weeks ago in chicago i was um, i was speaking at a different church i don't know if you remember in in in, in june we had a speaker from um, uh, from from chicago called larry perez who had spoken to our church talking about arrows out um i was speaking in his church um i was invited by his senior pastor who is who is pastor choko who was actually originally was supposed to come here um, um to come and meet him so i was speaking in larry's church and then i, I just had like half an hour time to go and meet pastor choko and come back so i went to between the services to meet him and so um, the, the moment i reached pastor choko said just wait for me we have something to do on the stage and while i was waiting for um, to to meet him and then rush back um, what i thought would never happen in a church was happening on the stage this entire team of that church new life covenant church last sunday two weeks two weeks ago was standing on the stage and then they said hey church this is what we want to do today we're going to pray for a couple and accept them as part of our lives and they said we're going to invite them on stage they invited a couple whose names are James McDonald and Kathy McDonald if you don't know who James McDonald and Kathy McDonald i won't blame you but they are one of the uh, one of the very well known pastors in this world they started in 1988 with 18 people in chicago um, started a church called harvest chapel last year 30 years later they had 17 campuses more than 13000 people then in their church huge they have done a lot of missionary work with even our, in our country james mcdonnell and kathy mcdonnell james mcdonnell was one of the most brilliant speakers you would ever hear brilliant expositor of those scriptures over the last 2 years they had few allegations that come upon him financial uh, abuse of power things like that and slowly his own church the church that he built turned against him to a point 4 months ago they threw him out of the church same church that he built threw him out of his church and so this new life covenant and i'm sitting there i know that i i followed i followed his story and i know what's happening in his life at that point of time i don't know whether he's right or wrong it doesn't matter at that point of time what was happening on stage was 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 something that i just thought didn't you know, that's not something i would see in a church definitely not in an indian church <laughs> is they invited both of them they the false accusation the accusations are still on them whether they are false or true doesn't matter right now it could be true but as they brought them onto stage all this pastoral team put their hands on them and they began to pray this this is what they're praying god we don't know what circumstances have led to this point we don't we don't know whether the accusations were true or wrong what we want to do at this point of time as the church of god is that you would fill us with your love so that we can give the same love to them i sat there with with my eyes wide open and i'm thinking that would never happen in a church 
if i do something wrong you would throw me without even thinking twice out of this church and i am very aware of that so i am sitting there and thinking wouldn't that be wonderful if capstan is like that for a selfish reason of course <laughs> from <laughs> but what a show of love of god acceptance and grace of god you know church is a place of protection church is a place of acceptance church is a place of protection church is a place of strength one of the reasons why we don't want to be in relationships with is because we always have this suspicion of inadequacy within us we feel that we are not good enough we feel that we have too many weaknesses to 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 do anything for the kingdom of god i want i i said it is suspicion of inadequacy because it is it is truly something that is not really true god created you uniquely with a gift we'll talk about it next sunday that all of us have a gift that is very specifically designed for you you are designed in such a way that you would use that gift and become useful in the hand of god but we believe we we look at all the things that we lack and we think um i don't think i'll fit into this i want you to know um uh, that it is at the church that you will find a person who is strong in your weakness and you would be strong in his weakness that's why we created small groups what we understand two hours sitting in this place you will not be able to develop quick relationships we understand that that's why the small groups that's why we have what we call plugins that you have the opportunity to meet people during the week spend time with them studying the scripture together it is the place where you will connect with others i mean really connect with play, uh, with others that's how we designed our plugins we want people to really know peop- other people you know in a, in, a, in a personal way it is a place where you can protect each other give care to each other and it is a place small groups are the place where you grow together if you look at the scriptures if you look at how the early church grew it grew in small groups every day they met together in the houses eating together and studying the word together it's in small groups church grows faster at some point we want tapstone to be a place uh, to be a church of small groups not with small groups that we are a church of small groups that you do church during the week at your home with others you come back on sunday morning here just to celebrate real church happens in small groups i want you to know that that's why it's really important for you to join smaller groups in our church and become part of uh, um uh, you know build friendships and relationships yes some relationships are going to be bad some friendships not really good good choices but just because you will obviously have one bad relationship does not mean there are no healthy relationships so join a plug in today by the way this is a promo for plug in <laughs> number see number 3 no god find freedom discover your purpose our goal this is our prayer our prayer is this that you may know the hope to which god has called you every one of you has a calling upon your life you may not know this right now but you have a calling upon your life just be in the you know just before i told you we're all royal priesthood we're all holy nation meaning this that every one of us have a calling upon our lives not necessarily to be a pastor of a church but you have a calling upon your life at your business business place at your workplace in your home to be the priest you are designed with a purpose and your design includes spiritual gifts that come from god we'll talk about how god designed us next sunday I'll come back to that that's why I'm not spending on the third point much God designed us very uniquely with a with a with a very interesting process he designed us so that he could use our life to fulfill his purpose in this world In fact we created the growth track 
to help you to discover what kind of gifts god gave you some of you may not know how, what kind of gifts you have but you probably are exhibiting them already without knowing and we want to help you in the growth track to find your own gifting what kind of gift did god give you uh, that you could actually use it in a you know in a proper way to help other people we'll talk about that in num- uh, number 4 so no god find freedom discover your purpose number 4 make a difference our prayer is this that you may grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that he has for his followers i like the way paul put put that in words right he said i i want you to grasp the immensity of the glorious way that god has for you what he's saying is this what you do matters to god is what he's saying you may not know the enormity of uh, 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 the immensity of the kind of difference that you're going to make you may not know that but god has already prepared that for you a few days ago we were sitting with uh, the banquet manager here and uh, we we, have, we were talking about um uh, doing a conference in february february 14th 15th we are actually going to do a program called uh, global leadership summit here in our church um so um we were talking about negotiating about the pricing and everything and and uh, and asking them the, the banquet manager to give us more discounts and, st- and stuff like that already they gave us good discounts by the way so we were trying to pull more and um uh, and you know while the conversation was happening uh, the banquet manager made a very interesting remark and i want you to li- listen to this very carefully this is what she said in the last six months after you guys came we made more profit than in the all, all the previous years i was I, i didn't expect that from her that's not something that i thought somebody would tell me but i realized this that everything that we do every sunday we pray for them we pray for this hotel we pray that the people who gave us this place be blessed and god is actually blessing them i want you to know that you are called to make a difference even with a small prayer you will still make a difference with see here is the point some of us we feel because we feel inadequate we we think that we i mean i'm not the guy who can make a difference um we want to give you a principle you know this, this is the last one i'm, I'm going to share that with you and close if you're a mathematics guy you'll remember this we call it the shamgar principle shamgar is a character in the bible just one story his entire story in just one verse judges chapter 3 verse 31 it 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 simply talks about a guy who took an ox goad and killed 600 people 600 philistines shamgar took an ox goad and killed 600 philistines if you have an ox goad in your hand ox goad is a small stick one and a half feet long stick a thin stick with a sharp edge what is it used for it is used to um help bulls move forward basically if you are a farmer and if you are tilling the soil when your bulls don't move forward and you know uh, um they are giving you trouble you would use an ox goad to push it at the back so that they would move forward that's all it is so that means shamgar was a farmer that much i know with an ox goad in his hand but he faced an immense task ahead of him 600 enemy soldiers were standing against him if he was like us he would have said i've got too little in my hand i have no experience in the warfare i don't know how to fight these guys i don't think i'm equipped enough I, i'm not the perfect guy should we probably look for david that's what shamgar would say I mean, if i would say if i was in shamgar's place but what he did is that he used the ox goad i don't know how he killed them that's one thing that i'm going to find out in heaven i don't know how he killed them he did kill them 600 of them with an ox goad so shamgar taught me a very important principle 
for success in life. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. That's a formula for success, by the way. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And there is no mountain that you cannot cross. There is no giant that you can bring down, that you can't bring down. If you can start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. That's how you begin to make a difference. We'll talk about it in the last Sunday of this series, more on making difference. How do we begin to make use our lives, what, what we have, little bit of what we have to, to bring a change uh, in the place that we are in. Take a moment to close your eyes right now. I want you to think about what you have heard today, this morning. You heard our prayer for you. In fact, this is truly God's heart for you. That you would be a person who knows him on a personal level. That you would be a person who experiences true freedom. Spiritual, emotional, any, any, any bondages that you're facing in your life. God wants to set you free of that. That you would be a person who discovers his purpose, her purpose. That you're created for something better, something wonderful. That unless you find that purpose, your, your life is always going to be unsatisfied and complete. But God spoke to you that you are a person who can make a difference with your life. You just have to believe this. That would be um, the first step towards the greatness that God can bring into your life. So I'm going to take this moment to pray with you. I'm not going to ask if you are inter- if you if you want me to pray for you or not because I do want to pray for you, all of you, whether you like it or not. That you would find God today. That you would find freedom. That you would find your purpose. And that you would know how to make a difference in this world. I'm going to pray with you right now. If that is your prayer, ask God for for a revelation of him. God, show me who you are. I want to know you on a personal basis. Ask him. If you are somebody who say, you know, I have always been struggling with developing healthy relationships. I want to find freedom from these bondages. Ask God to help set you free so that you can develop healthy relationships. If you're somebody who's saying, I don't know what is my purpose. I don't even know why I'm living right now. Ask God to reveal his purpose for you. He will. He will, my friend. And if you don't know where to start, Ask God to show you where to start. To beginning to make a difference.